Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Hello, I'm James Williams, and this is the latest edition of Men's Matters. On this one, we're focusing on domestic violence and the Mankind Conference, which is held at the Mars Centre, that's the chocolate people, in Slough near London uh, on the 10th of October 2013. Now, in domestic violence, where male victims are going to be discussed, how many times do you hear this little precursor to the uh, discussion? Last year, 17 men died at the hands of their female partner or ex-partner. We know the problem is nowhere near the same scale as women facing abuse in the home. Now, I don't know about you, I'm getting sort of fed up with that kind of thing because it's completely uh, misleading. And for those who are victims, male victims, it's very off-putting. It's bad enough trying to get men to go to the doctors, let alone come forward to uh, report domestic abuse without putting up deterrence like that. Now, at the meeting at the conference I w attended, attended, I challenged, um, what was her name? Baljeet Obey, who's an OBE, and she was chief crown prosecution. She was chief crown prosecutor uh, for the CPS Thames and Chiltern area. And I said to her when she came out with a statistic saying only 16 percent of men are victims. I challenged her on this. I also challenged her on why they use the campaign to stop violence against women and girls why is it it's so blatantly sexist that you know you can't ignore it but why do they allow it that in itself is a big boo term to say well we're only can consider half the population she responded they're saying well the law applied equally but the first thing you've got to do is for people to understand the law is equal and the way it's applied, the way it's presented, is not equal. And it does have a detrimental effect on whether men report domestic abuse. Now, one of the interesting things is that mankind have found that many of those that do report domestic abuse of males are very often females, female friends, relatives, whatever. On that same day, there was a BBC Radio 4 Woman's Hour programme uh, which gave had a, which had a, held a discussion on male victims of domestic abuse, and that little clip was from that. Uh, fortunately, to give the men's case, we had uh, Dr. Nicola Graham Kevin and Dr. Erica Bowen, who were there in the studios without interruption from feminists coming out with all their rubbish, and they were able to put the case that actually. When you look at the figures, things from uh, Don Dutton's research, from Martin Fiebert's research and, uh, and a bunch of others, which look at the, the longitudinal uh, data that actually go into the actual figures and actually and rather than some preordained number that they've decided to give. It shows that men are at least as likely to be victims of domestic abuse or interpersonal violence, as it's often called nowadays, as women. And in fact, women tend to be more violent than men overall. An interesting factor came out from that. One of the interesting factors is that is about self-control. Now, very often, it's not always the case when a man gets angry, he will get to a certain point where he'll either attack or he'll walk away where it seems that the case is often that with women who get angry they don't seem to have that cutoff switch they tend to carry on and persist until it becomes a violent assault and they tend not to be able to switch off and that's an interesting thing now i took the recorder with me 
to record as many as I could there were quite a few people so obviously most people didn't get recorded at this particular conference and by doing so I missed out on all the Maltesers being handed out I can only say to you I don't normally advertise commercial enterprises but Mars buy a Mars bar support them they were on our side on that day okay and so we'll go to the interviews presently and at the end of all the interviews I will play the uh, the Women's Abbots with Graham Kevin and Erica Bowen and you can hear for yourself what a good job they did. And the presentation of domestic abuse victims as male female I'm, I, and I am against this genderizing you know there's violent people and there's non-violent people there are victims and they're not victims you know well to genderize it is to distract from solving the problems and at the background of this I always feel there are children involved and it's the children who suffer the uh, what they see and what they hear and suffer physically as well if they're in the light the firing line now to misrepresent the reality of things by the mainstream media such as the BBC is is not only dishonest it's disrespectful and it ends up with children being put at risk from abusive mothers because they are not identified they're allowed to carry on controlling and harming children and not just physically but mentally as well however the problem is not so simple as just getting the BBC to wake up and speak the truth because there is a stigma and perception about domestic violence which goes right back into childhood and this is something Erica Bowen also focused on in her talk when they did a focus study of children young people they found as with adults that many people do not believe that a female assaulting a male is very serious the other way around is always or nearly always serious but for a female to assault a male well it's not that serious it's not that important you know but what was what was uh, quite obviously pointed out that men boys have nerve endings just like girls and women do if you hit a male it will hurt him the same as you hit a female female so you know they hurt just the same cut and I will bleed that kind of thing so why is it acceptable it's never acceptable to go and assault somebody in those circumstances unless you're it's self-defense I would, I would grant that but to go and attack somebody male or female is wrong now there's a natural instinct to protect children and women by both men and women but there's not necessarily a natural instinct to protect men and this is the fundamental psychology of it Yet until you can overcome that that hurdle male victims are always going to struggle and languish as the Cinderella's in the domestic violence framework even boys early on are taught to be stoic to defer their emotions and put off their pain in effect they're being taught and brought up to consider themselves disposable to sacrifice themselves male victims of domestic abuse are frequently all too frequently not believed some people believe they deserve it somehow that they've cheated and they you know get what's coming to them and that they are hiding their own wickedness their own perpetration of violence themselves by claiming victimhood when they're the perpetrators for real messages from campaigns about stopping violence against women and girls are bigoted and a deterrent in spite of the law supposedly applying both ways and it, <clears throat> ingrained in those prejudices that I described it goes into the authorities teachers social workers politicians the police judges and the public at large passing bystanders if you like and what we've done is we've created a climate that allows female perpetrators to claim victimhood male victims to be ignored vilified and ridiculed it's a madness and that and this the same falsehood are set to be repeated by the next generation if feminist dogma is allowed to flourish in education and upbringing 
Right, enough of me ranting on. We'll go to the interviews. OK, I'm at uh, Mankind Initiative Conference in uh, Slough, in, uh, just outside London, I think Slough is, if you don't know where Slough is. OK, with uh, Mark Brooks, who's chairman of Mankind Initiative, and uh, we just finished the, the conference. You must be very pleased with the outcome. It's been a fantastic day, a real game-changer, because it, this conference has been putting the issue of male victims of domestic abuse firmly on the map. It means now that all of those 120 people who are here today will go away, think about the services that they provide, and make sure that they also include male victims of domestic abuse and their children. Society is changing in Britain today. It's up to all of us here and everybody else to make sure that the momentum that's come out of this conference continues. And so next year, we haven't just got 120 people here, we've got 240. That's the aim. Mm. And the uh, Mars Centre have been very, very good at uh, supporting this initiative, haven't they? And, uh, you know, it's good to get a corporation as big as Mars behind this. Oh, Mars have been fantastic. I mean, for them to be able to, if you like, donate their conference centre today has meant that um, not only has it meant that we've got brilliant facilities but also on a very practical level it's enabled us to keep the price of the conference down so enabling more people from hard press councils police forces probation trusts and other charities to be able to afford to come um, the key thing for us was just to make sure that we brought in enough funds to cover the cost of the conference because it's all about the cause yeah well, you, uh, it's been a real takeoff. I mean, from a few years back, scraping the barrel, and now you're up, up with the with the best now, and uh, looking forward to next year. It's very positive to hear this. You look, doubling the numbers and this sort of thing. But uh, when are the mainstream media going to start latching onto this big time? Well, I think the issue is is that for us to actually keep at the media, yeah. keep complaining when any of their uh, media coverage is only about female victims, and also making sure that we're making a noise, that we're producing the right statistics, we have the right stories, and also that we are providing support to the media when they come a-calling. We've already seen today that Radio 4 Women's Hour have actually covered this subject, and that's where the issue of male victims needs to be, um, at the forefront of all journalists' mind, as well, of course, being a key focus for men's matters. Mm. Well, I have to say thank you very much for that, and uh, it's been a real pleasure. And I tell you this much: I'm, I got the feeling here that it started off well, and it just got better. Oh, absolutely! And I think I think what was great about today, we had representatives from the legal system, we had academics with the research to underpin the work that we do, and then we had solicitors, we had male idfers, and also we had a range of other charities in the sector actually showing what the solutions on the ground would be. It was a complete program, and everybody I know who was here today has left with a spring in their step and got something out of it. It was a real game changer. Mm. And, and I think as well that uh, it was a lot of courage by uh, Ian, who was one of the victims, and, uh, and uh, it was graphic and very, very moving, his story. And uh, I, had to, I, I uh, you know, I'm sure people had a few, a few damp eyes listening to what he was saying because he was a real, real, real victim and, and has, has coped very well and shown great courage in recovering as he has done. Well, Ian... It, it's been a real advocate and a pleasure to work with because not only is it the fact that he's fully able to talk about what happened to him and also how he survived the situation so any men um, listening to uh, his story will actually understand that you can get out of the situation but also the fact that he goes around the country talking about male victims and the need for support for them you know he's a real asset to anybody wanting to provide support to male victims because he he opens people's eyes you can put things on paper you can have the likes of me talking as much as i would like but people like ian really do make the difference thanks mark and all the best to you thank you OK, with Ian now, who is, is a genuine, real victim, and he put on a great uh, performance today, and I th don't think there were any dry eyes in the, in the house here. Uh, I, I was certainly swallowing hard, but I'm a fairly weak character on that anyway. But, Ian, um, tell us about what happened to you in, in, in your victimhood. 
Well, I mean, my experience of domestic abuse was physical, it was emotional, psychological, uh, and the best way to describe the impact is to simply say it took me to the brink of suicide. It's something I contemplated for the first and only time in my life. Uh, an example of the physical assaults were cigarettes that were lit and placed up my nostrils, and a kettle of water boiled and poured over me and then reboiled. I was assaulted with a steam iron three, on three occasions. I was attacked with a hammer. The list was endless. And we saw, saw horrible photographs of your arm, which is basically smashed and bruised and, and scarred horribly like somebody who's just been in a car crash. Unfortunately, that's not a unique thing for some of the victims, is it? I mean, they do have to experience that. And you had the courage to come forward, and I think a lot of people gave you credit for that. Yes, I mean, I think certainly the, the, the idea of sharing some of the crime scene photos is just to, to send home that message of the physical impacts. Of course, the psychological side is, is much more difficult to overcome. But the message really for any victim, but particularly for men, is to try and find the strength to confide in someone. Uh, and, and it's perhaps easier on occasions to report indirectly. If you find that strength, and I appreciate and completely understand that trust will be in short supply, you can take life-changing, if not life-saving action, and you can do that today. There are many people out there with the skills to help you. Hmm. And you mentioned in your thing it was, it, was, it was an Olympics to try and get things sorted out. I mean, you've still been on that Olympic task because you're actually carrying the flame for domestic violence victims around the country. And, and uh, I, I've, I've heard of you uh, going to different places. Uh, and that takes a degree of strength in itself to keep... I mean, is it not reliving the horror of what, what, what you went through each time you tell this story? Sure, it's, it's an interesting point that you make, but what I've learned to deal with is that by reliving those events, if it changes one poster for an awareness campaign, if it encourages one victim to come forward, that is tremendously rewarding. And whilst I can't change my own circumstances, by sharing those experiences, I hope it will give the strength to people to come forward because, as I've indicated, that will be life-changing, if not life-saving. Mm. So it is about getting the balance, but it's about helping others, and that's really important. Mm. How long did you actually endure all the, the abuse before it actually got taken seriously by anyone? Uh, well, for me, the, the relationship was 18 months. The abuse landed, lasted for 14 months, continuous. I lived a life of a hermit for many of those 14 months. Mm. Uh, and in reality, the trigger mechanism was the knock on the door from the police, which allowed me to be rescued. Mm. I'd given up hope ultimately. And, and it was a, it was a neighbour that, that called, or so, an anonymous caller? Well, for, for many years of, since my escape it was anonymous, but in the last 12 months I have now found out that it was a neighbour's daughter's boyfriend, and his reason for contacting the police was that his girlfriend was pregnant and he was actually fearful of her own safety because of how he'd seen my own condition uh, yeah. regress. Yeah, and this is one of the problems is people reporting it, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, you know, they, they tend to turn a blind eye when it's, uh, when it's a male victim. Yes, I think you're absolutely right, the point that you make, and we could, we could levy that particular point of view at many other areas of crime, but certainly for victims of domestic abuse and for male victims in particular, there is certainly a reliance to find somebody who is strong enough to make that call, and of course the message is, is that you can make that call completely anonymously to Crime Stoppers or to your local police and your call will be taken seriously and that, could, as in my case, could trigger the intervention from the police that will definitely change somebody's life. So my message is, if you have any concerns, whether it be about a neighbour, a work colleague, whether it be about your brother, your son or dad, find the strength, be brave, pick up the phone and make that life-changing call today. Thank you, Ian. I'm going to talk to David Yarwood, who's just attended the conference here. Uh, he's uh, a member of Parity. That's right. That's right. And uh, what do you think about the, uh, the conference this year, David? I think it's been very excellent. Uh, they've covered a far range of issues mm. and aspects which needed publicising. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, expositions, I think, have been very clear yeah. uh, and valuable. And uh, I hope uh, people who attended here today will... Mm. Uh, broadcast them in their own little areas as well. Yeah. Uh, were, there, were there any highlights in particular you were outstand you thought was outstanding? Well, I think uh, most interesting was the uh, the police uh, confirmation that if they uh, find uh, there's been mutual violence or by direction, they will arrest both parties. That is, I think, a welcome 
used that, because that there be has a been change, a sea change, doesn't it? Because that's what, not how they were before. That's right, because there, there was an impression that, in fact, they usually only arrested the man. That's right. Yeah. Unless he was lying down on his back with a knife in his chest. Yeah. So uh, th that is a, a welcome sign, as practiced by Thames Valley Police. Mm. Because the major problem, as was highlighted here at the conference, is the media, getting the media to take on board that the, the, you know, it shouldn't be a gender-based consideration. Yes, uh, I think uh, I've seen uh, a few programmes which actually uh, picture a male victimisation at Intimate Violence. Uh, a dispatches programme way back in 1998, I think, was a programme about 100 male victims throughout the UK, which I think was a very important sort of um, advance in the on, uh, advertising this year. I don't think, I don't recall seeing anything from the BBC about male victimisation. Occasionally they have something about female victims, uh, particularly when there's some horror story in the headlines uh, involving a woman victim. I've no no complaint about uh, publicity given to women victims, but I don't think they're just as alert to giving the same attention to male victims. And uh, I hope someone like the BBC, maybe today's Women's Hour broadcast will will help with that sort, sort of absence. Well, of they, they, cer they certainly need to, to change their attitude in that way. Being the, the major broadcasting organisation in Britain, they need to look at things a bit more uh, balanced. Yes, uh, I don't want to get into the politics of the BBC. Uh, <laughs> it's widely regarded as perhaps left of centre. And of course, male victimisation has always been uh, a, a no-go zone for left of centre. And I, 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 I hope that uh, with the new brush at the BBC and the criticisms that's been levelled at it recently, they, they'll give a bit of time to issues which aren't so popular. That's fine. Thank you very much, David. Have a safe journey home. <laughs> just, just, sorry, Anne. Are you willing to have a little recording? Um, <laughs> well, you can join in. It's OK. Uh, I'm talking to Anne Yarwood. You stand for Ascent, A-S-C. What does Ascent? Um, it's um, Ascot Community Environment Network. Right. And we are a transition initiative. There are transition towns all over the world now. Um, our focus is on climate change, but environment, as far as we're concerned, is absolutely everything, because there is the sense that um, in physics or in biology or in a spiritual belief, we are all one. We are all one. Are you, are you concerned about, uh, I expect you are concerned about certain chemicals getting into the environment and uh, altering uh, people themselves with uh, you know, pollutants because I think there was a Dr Warren Farrell uh, who mentioned this that um, there were chemicals from plastics getting into the environment and altering uh, men and women. Yeah, well yeah. I haven't given that much thought but yeah. I think in, um, environmental pollution mm. from chemicals is enormous. Yeah. I'm interested in this because David, my husband, devotes so much of his life to this issue and I'm absolutely with him. I'm, I'm an activist but I'm also for many years have been in development education that's questioning um, issues in the developing world. I'm also a counsellor so I'm very interested in conflict resolution. Yes. Conflict conflict resolution. So you find this conference uh, quite it, useful? It, it was splendid. Yeah, yeah. No, it is absolutely splendid. And the range of topics, um, and m my thought is always people's passion. Yes. Passion yeah. is motivating. Mm. And it was quite full as well. There's quite a lot of interest from oh, across the board. It's absolutely splendid. I think yeah. it's one of the best conferences I've ever been to yeah. in covering the range of topics yeah. and very applicable. These two young Young women lawyers. I was yeah. very moved by them because they, they did a very good uh, the, humorous uh, double act, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, but the, the, I was thinking about the lawyers, the, uh, yeah, the, the legal lawyers. aid. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the cutting in legal aid, if you're yeah. interested in social justice, is absolutely despicable. Yeah. But most of what's going on in this government is despicable, yeah. <laughs> in my opinion. Okay, thank you very much.
Right, I'm with uh, Mike Buchanan, who is the leader of the... Of, of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them. I'm glad you said that, because I get <laughs> tongue-tied otherwise. Now, what made you form a party? Um, well, it, it struck me um, a few years ago that um, men and boys are assaulted by the state, by, by the state's actions and inactions in many, many areas. We have in our um, consultation document, which you can download from j4mb.org.uk, um, um, 20 areas where, 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 where the state assaults men and boys. Um, and domestic violence is, is, is probably one of the top two or three areas because um, the, the, you know, there are very sound statistics showing that women are at least as aggressive as men um, with respect to their inter interpersonal relationships. Um, and yet something like 99.7% of state resources that go into this area go, go towards women. I mean, men, men um, are, are totally neglected in this area as in many others, and it's our view that it's probably a major driver of suicide, and uh, more than three times, or about three times as many men as women commit suicide to this day. So what do you think about this, this conference, Mankind Conference Day? Uh, Did it not start off a little bit tame and warmed up, as so to speak? With I, the... I, I thought it was just outstanding. Yeah. I mean, f for me, the, um, the most interesting session was the one uh, presented by Dr. Nicola Graham Kevin, who's a senior lecturer at the School of Psychology at the University of Central Lancashire. And she actually appeared on Woman's Hour this morning, so I'm looking forward to listening to that this evening and, uh, and, uh, and possibly doing a piece on the blog in the next day or two. You know, I, I learned an awful lot more about um, domestic violence against men than, than I knew before. Um, really quite extraordinary. And uh, I understand that we're, we're going to be having the slides as well. So I'll try and get those on the website. Um, but the, you know, the more you learn about domestic violence and the fact it's not gendered, uh, the more outrageous is is you know is, is the state's treatment of men. Mm. I think as well. I mean, I obviously saw the same thing, and, and she was quite uh, Nicola Graham uh, Kevin uh, hyphenated name. Yes. Uh, I, I thought she was quite impressive because not just she didn't just throw up statistics; she made them come to life. She absolutely did. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, there were just so many nuances, yeah. which I simply hadn't hadn't known about before. Yeah. So. Um, and she understood all the counter arguments and things like that. Oh, absolutely. Know, I, 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 I mean, to be honest, I'm, I'm astonished they had her on Woman's Hour. Yeah. Because. Because she was just so impressive, and uh, I mean, a few people have told me that it's it's always more. I mean, to women, it's always more authoritative when a woman talks on a subject. Mm. So, 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 so the fact that Women's Hour has has um, you know a, a female expert on domestic violence, which doesn't um, pursue the feminist narratives of of uh, Women's Hour, I think is very significant. I mean, I, I'd very much like to to, to see Erin Pitsey. Um, on Woman's Hour, I think it's been many, many years since, since she was last on it. You know, it's there's something changing in the zeitgeist. Mm. The fact that even Woman's Hour, I think it's it's only two or three months since they last did mm. um, a piece on male victims of domestic violence, and it shows that somewhere, you know, rumbling around the BBC, is a recognition that as a, if, uh, you know, if you like a, a, you know, a public broadcaster, they really. You know they have to to, to, to accept that, mm. that 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 men are, men and boys are human as well. They have to come into the 21st century. They, basically. they absolutely do. They yeah, absolutely do. Yeah. Uh, and you know because they are yeah. they're, 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 their suppression of the facts um, on so many levels is mm. is simply outrageous. And mm. uh, and more and more more and more men are really calling them out on it. Mm. Now I know this is Men's Matters Radio. Yes. But uh, and so I've, I would have a little bit of a bias if I didn't say that. But so you know my sympathies are with you. But. Let me just ask you this: Do you uh, do you get um, threats or, or uh, cat calls and, and call misogynistic? And um, yes, I mean um, you couldn't be in, you couldn't do what I do or what you do, James. Yeah. Um, if you know if, if if you crumbled at being called a misogynist <laughs> or a sexist or a or, or, or a dinosaur, I mean I, I had a letter printed in a local paper a couple of weeks back about the dire impact of on the NHS of. Um, the policy of driving up the proportion of women doctors um, and, and basically I outlined in the letter that, that it had been a disaster for patients and taxpayers because female doctors are far more likely than male doctors to quit the profession altogether they're far more likely to work part time uh, they're far more likely to refuse to work weekends and unsocial hours um, and, they're far, and they're, they're far less inclined to work in the really stressful departments like A&E so the, 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 the service is on its knees in lots of areas um, so, 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 so that letter was printed, and um, in the next week or two, there were, I think, four or five letters from people calling me variously a sexist, misogynist. Um, you know, people, uh, men saying, "My God, if I talk like that, my 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 wife and daughter would kill me." But not one of them um, answered the substantive points of the letter. So I've just had another letter printed, yes. which says, which says, you know, you know, can, can we park this? Can we park these shaming tactics? Yeah. 
and actually engage in uh, an adult debate. I, I just wish that the, the word misogynist wasn't so misused. Oh, misogynist means you hate all women. It's, it's nonsense. It is, it is quite ridiculous. Um, um, it's, I think it's a projection, you know. I, I, I think... Um, <laughs> I think actually quite a substantial proportion of women are mildly or very misandrist. Um, and and they, they project that onto men. But in, in my experience, a tiny proportion of men are misogynistic. And even even I find that when men have been, let's say, the, the victims of false rape allegations or of really appalling domestic violence, they, they, their antipathy is not, after that is not towards women as, as a group. It is towards a woman. Mm, or a few so. women, uh, um, whereas you know, I, I, you know, I mean, there's a lot of evidence to, to you know to suggest that leading militant feminists um, have had very difficult relationships with fathers and, and and partners, and and feminism gives them a way to, if you like, to attack men. Yeah, they generally. All men, don't they? They, 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 right, yeah. they, they, they do, and of course, yeah. men have yeah. no equivalent to that, and there will never be a male equivalent of feminism. No. Um, but that's that's another that's I, another debate altogether. I, I personally found it very difficult to engage with a feminist on a rational debate. Oh, oh you may as well try and engage yeah. with the goldfish. And I, I do wonder, you know, the ones I have engaged with, whether they have got a personality disorder or something. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, maliciously. This was what I found. No, the, no, they, they they absolutely are. I mean, you know, there is. It, I mean, gender feminism, which is the one that w gets us, well, that we're so interested in. Um, is, is basically a hate-driven female supremacy movement, and it's, but it's the only form of feminism which has been of the slightest consequence for, for somewhere between 30 and 40 years in the UK yeah. and increased across much of the developed world. Um, and I find, you know, when, when, when the average woman says she's a feminist, you know, if you ask what does she mean by that, she, yeah. it's, it's a completely different... She doesn't mean a gen, gender yeah. feminism, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's gender feminism, which is, you know, the Harriet Harmans of this world, it, it's, it's they who are poisoning every, you know, almost every pillar of, of civilised society. Well, so, some women, who, a lot of women who say, I'm a feminist, I mean, they might as well just say, I'm a Manchester United supporter. I, exactly. You know, exactly. They, or, or, they've never been to Manchester United or something No, like no, that. no. It's, <laughs> it's, it's utterly meaningless. And I, I think it's a sort of like a herd thing. It's, it's, um, um, women are very are far more concerned than men about social exclusion. Yeah. And a few women have told me that, that women you know, learn in the, in, in the playground about being in the in-group or, or not. And, and women, I mean, in fact, I only know two prominent women in the country with any sort of public profile who are happy to self-identify as anti-feminists, and that's um, Angela Epstein and Katie Hopkins. Um, even women like Melanie Phillips, incredibly, will not go beyond saying they're non-feminists. Yes, and she's made a few critical points. She about has. It. Yes, um, right, yes. It's really quite an extraordinary yeah. thing, and I, I hope one day that... Uh, yeah. Well, it's difficult to read her stuff and say, well, you know, it so clearly is anti-feminist. Yeah, it's, but, a, uh, but, uh, it's a curious thing. I, 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 do, I do think, though, that there's one of the things that is promising, and when they've had uh, cases like that, that uh, boy up in Scotland who was abused on, and it was on YouTube uh, by a girl half his size, and she yes. was whacking at him and things like that, yes. most of the uh, uh, antagonism against it were women saying yes. this is outrageous and yes. disgraceful. Yes, And yes, it's, yes. it's encouraging to see that uh, women do think rationally. They're oh, not indeed. all like the feminists. No, we, no, we, indeed. But you, you kind of have to really present them with it. Yes. And, and certainly we found, as far as our party is concerned, that you know we, we have quite a few female members and sorry, female supporters and donors. Um, but 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 there is something different about that group and the men who support us. And the I think almost without exception, the women who support us um, do so because they've had some personal life experiences, uh, maybe even ongoing. Which so for example, typically they they might be denied access to their grandchildren because of a spiteful former daughter-in-law. Or they might have a son who was the subject of domestic violence, mm. and it is always something personal. Uh, now it often is with men who support us, maybe half of them, but 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 half of them support us because they think there's a justice issue. Yes. And women, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are exceptions. There are always exceptions to every rule, but women just don't seem to have that that political sense or interest. You know, they mm. their world is 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 their personal world in, in a way that. I don't think men kind of quite, quite see the well, world like that. When you mentioned about doctors before, it relates to that in many ways, that you know, there's certain jobs which are male predominant. My job is, is mainly male. Yes, yes. Uh, but that's a personal choice. No one is stopped from going to see. No woman is stopped no. from going to see. No, no, no. And yet they choose, if they do go to see, they tend to be on cross-channel ferries or passenger ships. Yes. They don't go on tankers so much. No, no, no. Or, or some uh, dirty cargo ship somewhere. No. They go on, the, on you know, where, where there's people. No, you know? Well, I mean, yeah. women are just highly selective. So you take, yeah. uh, you, you know, you take the NHS. I mean, 70% of medical students today are women, 
Um, but the NHS is in crisis. I mean, that, that policy of driving up women in medicine has been a disaster for patients and uh, for the taxpayer because uh, female doctors are far more likely than male doctors to, um, to quit the profession altogether. It costs a quarter of a million pounds to train a doctor, but never mind. Um, they're far more likely to work part-time uh, than male doctors. They're far more likely to refuse to work on social hours and weekends. And... Um, uh, and, 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 and they also refuse yeah. to work in areas like A&E, which are very yeah. stressful. And it's not always because they've got children, is it? No, it's, it's absolutely not. No, no. no. Um, so, so as a result, you know, you just get far, you know, you, you know uh, typically, for, you know, let's say for, you know, for, for 50 female medical students, um, you, might get, you might get the same work output as 25 male students. So, you know, how can that not be a disaster for anybody? Mm. Uh, but that's the policy direction. You know, it's a, if, if you take engineering, for at least 30 years, to my knowledge, um, the government and uh, professional bodies and whatever else have been trying to drive up the number of women in engineering and, uh, and some other areas. Um, and, but, but even today, 90% of graduate engineers are, are men. Um, but 90% of psychology graduates are women. Yeah. There's not, there's not one penny. It's not, it's not, that's not seen as a problem. And not one penny. You know, nobody's campaigning to correct that, inverted commas. It's, it's, it is just madness. Okay, thank you, Mike. It's a great pleasure. Tony Stott, you're, you represent Healing Men, is that correct? Healing Men, that's right. Um, yeah. It's an organisation that uh, originated in Wales, um, but now it's got a more general aspect of men's rights. And how, how do you feel about this conference today? Well, uh, mixed. In, uh, the, 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 I, I was really um, upset about the very feminist um, dogma that was underlying this, the, the talks in the early part of the day. And I thought, I'd actively thought about going mm. because I thought, I'd, I've heard all this, I don't want to hear it again. But then the, the, um, the talks about um, putting a, bringing a different perspective, um, this issue about recognising women's violence and the effect on children mm. and looking at how we can intervene and focusing on children and as, as, as breaking this intergenerational so, uh, uh, cycle of uh, domestic violence and abuse um, is really where we've got to look. But we can't look at that when A... The court system, society leaves children with abusive mothers and abusive mothers and violent mothers are not seen and not heard. We have to do something that recognises them, uh, uh, how to respond to them and how to uh, keep children safe. And we need to, uh, and that, that kind of came out, not, as, not in those words, but it did come out this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, but so therefore, leaving the conference, you feel better than you did at the start, basically. Well, yeah. It, it, well, yes, in some ways, and, and and it's always good to meet up with people who are active and involved and intelligent and aware about these issues, because so much of it goes on beneath the radar that we just not you know, it's not seen in the, in the general population. But to come together with a group of people who at least are interested in these issues and. Um, are prepared to discuss them uh, is a great thing and it's brilliant and I think Mark and uh, Mankind have done a really fantastic job today. Okay, thanks very much Tony. Thank you. Okay, Ian, uh, you just finished the uh, seeing the Mankind conference, what do you think of it? Uh, were, you, were you impressed or not? Yes, um, it's just so refreshing that people finally have taken on board the idea that men can be victims, especially um, women's aid, now, or, or some, some aspect, parts of women's aid. Are, did you, not, are did you find it interesting? That's that. right. They, some of them actually changing the name from women's aid to yeah. other That's other very names. encouraging. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a few years ago, I just wouldn't have thought it was possible, given yeah. the nature of gender politics. Um, I hope that this is the start of uh, a revolution in this area. I don't know if it will be or not, but it can, we can only be encouraged by what we've heard uh, today. I mean, there's still a notion, or there was initially at the start of the conference that the vast majority of victims were female and men were a minority um, but later on a lady Nicola, somebody I can't remember her name, she challenged this and said actually it's far more equal and often it's the other, uh, there's more male victims 
Yeah. Um, she based it on very good yes. sound research. Yes, and, and, that, uh, that's you know, right. To come up with that. Yes. yes. Um, yeah. So that also is a very important point that needs to be got, got yeah. across. Um, I just hope that the, the movement, can, that this idea, can really take off um, and get national attention, both yeah. from politicians, the media, and the, and the public. And at the moment, it's still a minority yeah. issue. <laughs> but I suppose this we can only be encouraged by what we've heard today. But uh, there's still a long way to go. Yeah, you, you feel happy about you leaving here, more positive than you did when you came here, though. Um, Yes, I mean, I suppose I knew when I came here that the issue, the, the, the conference was about male victims of domestic so I was positive in that sense. Yeah. Um, and it just reaffirmed that. Um, yes, uh, it's what I expected in that sense. So I feel positive, it, things are going in the right direction, but there's still a long way to go, and I'm yeah. still very worried about the current situation. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of raising awareness. So, yes, I can't say I'm really happy I won't be happy until the problem is solved but um, it, the conference was good and we can only be happy with, with the outcome. what we heard, so we heard yeah. today yeah. yes thank you very much thank okay. you okay uh, with Margaret Gardner just finishing the Mankind Initiative uh, conference on domestic abuse uh, Margaret you're, you're representative of FASO what does FASO do um, well, false allegations support organisation right. support those that say they're falsely accused of abuse or child mm. protection issues, mm. and we endeavour to empower them to help themselves and forward them onto the relevant areas that they need to speak to. And in, div in domestic violence cases, we forward them on to mankind to deal with the domestic... And you have a helpline, don't you? And is it, is, are the number of calls increasing overall? Yes, our helpline is on an evening, 6 till 9pm. The number of calls have been increasing yes. rapidly, but unfortunately we've got very few voluntary staff so we can't answer as many uh, people as we would like but we just like people to continue to call because we're the only organization of our type yeah. and, I support people. and I suppose mankind is one of the organizations you refer victims to but uh, what do you think of the conference today I, I believe the conference was really good yeah. it covered a cross-section of people it made uh, those that don't normally deal with DV aware and I think it opened people's eyes yes. and ears to what can happen with DVs. Yeah. Thank you very much Margaret, thank you. Have thank you. Uh, got Ben here, um, Ben you've uh, attended this conference and been helping out quite uh, quite diligently, uh, what do you think of it? I think it's very good, it's very good that we get, can get so many people together who yeah. all are aiming for the same thing um, and working towards the same goal really and of what kind of working off the same hymn sheet, singing off the same hymn sheet, so it's really positive. You're coming back next year? Uh, hopefully so, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. No problem, thank you. Well, that was the Domestic Violence Conference put on by Mankind Initiative. A very, very successful conference, I've got to say. One of the best ones I've come across. And uh, yes, I'm in a different room in the house. I do have more than one room in the house. And I've changed my shirt. OK, now as promised, I will play the uh, contribution by Dr Nicola Graham Kevin and Dr Erica Bowen when they appeared on BBC Radio 4's Woman's Hour that same day of the conference. They had a busy day that day. Here we go then. Joining me to discuss the typical profile of a female perpetrator and how society views male victims are psychologist Dr Erica Bowen, reader in the psychology of intimate partner violence at Coventry University, and Dr Nicola Graham Kevin, reader in the psychology of aggression at the University of Central Lancashire. Good morning. 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 Nicola, how much is there a problem with men not reporting domestic violence? Um, yes, there's certainly a problem with it. Um, I think the, the campaigns that we've had for women have, have really helped uh, women to define abuse against them uh, as violent, but we haven't had the same campaigns for men. And so men typically wouldn't associate uh, being hit or punched or uh, any other means of aggression by their partner. Many wouldn't associate that as domestic violence and certainly wouldn't associate it as a criminal act. Erica? 
Um, I completely agree. I mean, we know that there is an awful lot of, of shame involved in being a victim of domestic violence for women anyway. Um, when we see that, if you look at something like the British Crime Survey, we know that women are unlikely to see what they go through as domestic violence, men even more so. Um, so there's certainly an awful lot that needs to be done in terms of raising awareness that men and women equally can go through domestic violence. We can argue about the rates of who does what when, mm. but that it can actually happen to men and that men should be taking it seriously and consequently that all of our responding organisations should also be equally taking it okay. seriously. Nicola, for a lot of people, they can't imagine a woman doing this. It, you know, for whatever reason, the media, the influence of strength, physicality. What is the profile of a typical woman abuser? Uh, women abusers are as diverse as male abusers, but broadly, uh, the, the sort of typologies tend to be similar to male abusers. In that you've got one that's a family-only abuser. She'll be a woman who's not generally violent outside the home, uh, hasn't got a history maybe of violence in different relationships, but maybe there's just something about that, that relationship uh, that's particularly provocative. Uh, but more commonly, the ones that will uh, result in injuries and police interventions and the need for help... Uh, other ones where the women have a, a history of childhood uh, neglect and abuse, so when they were growing up in a very difficult home life, which is similar to male perpetrators, I will add. Um, these women often uh, find that they have real problems regulating their own emotional experiences and they find it very hard to tolerate distress. Um, and through learning history of seeing violence perpetrated in their home uh, as children and also through this real overwhelming emotional experience they have, uh, they can use aggression towards their partners, you know, for a multitude of reasons. Erica, you've been looking specifically at children's attitudes to violence within the context of their own relationships. What were the differences in the way that children viewed violence against a boy <coughs> by a girl as opposed to the other way around? Um, it was quite stark, actually. I mean, we interviewed um, adolescents in the UK, Sweden, Germany and Belgium, um, and they all took part in focus groups um, discussing what they understood to be violence in relationships. And it was very, very clear that their attitude towards violence was that actually violence by girls isn't really violence, that it can't be taken seriously, that it would never kind of lead to anything particularly serious. And it kind of has a link into also how they believed people would then engage in help seeking which is that boys simply wouldn't because well you wouldn't want to go and seek help if you've been beaten up by a girl because you'd be deemed to be silly and you'd be embarrassed. But Erica why are we happy to see women as victims but not men? I think it's a, a difficult question to answer. I think we've had the last 30, 35, 40 years of empowering women, raising um, awareness about women's issues and domestic violence being a very core part of that. And whether or not it's an artefact that actually, whilst we've had our eye on the ball in terms of women's victimisation, we've taken it off in relation to men's victimisation, I don't know. I find it very concerning, though, because we do have evidence that suggests that attitudes that are condoning of violence actually lead people into being violent in the future, particularly in adolescent samples. OK. Nicola, how, how bad can the abuse be? Well, it can be very minor, um, from slapping and uh, pushing, which is still unpleasant. I mean, many women say, uh, I didn't think the, uh, my aggression would hurt him. Well, even being slapped hurts men. They have got nerve endings the same as women. Um, but it can range right up to, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, homicide and so forth. Women... Uh, do lack the physical strength often, but they can make up with that with tenacity, with men's reluctance to use aggression towards their partners, men's chivalry, uh, and also with weapon use as well, which is uh, sort of quite common. So for women, uh, using sharp in instruments okay. uh, is and, quite and common. You know about this small amount of research that's been done, don't you, on, on mums hitting dads. What did that show and what was the effect on children? Well, what we know, the, the research on mums hitting dads versus dads hitting mums is not as robust as some of the other research but what we see is either the effect is similar or it can actually be more damaging for the children um, and this may be because mums hitting dads those women have a, a personality style which is hostile um, non-close and so forth and, and Research suggests, developmental research suggests, children brought up with that type, type of mothering fare very badly. So for those children, they lack that secure bond that is really essential for us to grow up and be happy uh, adults uh, in, our, in our time. So, Erica, what do you think about the idea that women don't think of when they're doing violence as violence? They, they somehow see it as empowering or cool and they've got that message maybe from media. <clears throat> 
I think it's a difficult position to kind of certainly to condone. Um, I think certainly there is some evidence that suggests that some young people and some young females do think that it's a sign of women's empowerment, that they're kind of reasserting themselves in their relationships, they're getting what they want, they're being more assertive. Um, I think in the same way that we've had arguments about you know, societies condo uh, you know, condoning um, male violence, we have to look at the way that we view violence, the way that we portray it on the media, um, and all of those messages that are filtering down to actually see if there is a link. I don't think at the moment there is a clear enough link to be able to say, yes, it's definitely the media's fault. Um, but certainly in our um, research, when we were asking young people about how they learnt about violence, um, they were actually said that they're more aware of news stories. So for them, their message that women are, are victims and men are perpetrators came from the way that it's portrayed in the news because you don't really see that many male victims being reported on in, in news stories. OK. Dr Erica Bowen and Dr Nicola Graham-Kevin, thank you both very much thank indeed. You. Thank you. And that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed this one. It's uh, certainly been uh, packed full of information. Uh, if you're looking at it on YouTube, you'll need to uh, perhaps uh, sequence some of the stuff again. Uh, I'll put as much as I could into this to uh, help people who are involved in this need support, need uh, doing research and things like that. So uh, until next time, from Men's Matters, I'm James Williams. Take care of yourself.